Now, someone who's following the crisis here closely is Elliot Ackerman. He's the author and former U.S. Marine who served five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan and has just spent two weeks here in Kyiv. Ackerman joined Walter Isaacson to discuss Russia's new tactics and the role of moral resolve in war. Thank you, Christian and Elliot Ackerman. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Walter. Russia has just said that it's going to concentrate now on the eastern Ukraine and try to pull back some of its troops from Kiev. You've just spent two weeks in Kiev and the parts of Ukraine. Tell me why you think this is happening. I think it's a it's Russia conceding that the initial objectives of its invasion were too large. They do not have what in military terms we call the troops to task to take all of Kyiv, let alone all of Ukraine. I mean, Kyiv, this is a massive city of nearly four million inhabitants before the war. Um, so oh, the fact that they are pulling out of Kyiv and trying to focus now in the east and in the south shows that war is entering a new phase in which the Russians will, I believe, be pursuing a more limited set of objectives. You know, you write in a piece in The Atlantic that the Russians don't know how to empower their soldiers. You're a Marine in uh, Iraq and in Afghanistan. What's the difference between the way you felt empowered and the way Russian troops are fighting? So in NATO countries, we employ what are called mission tactics. And what that means is there is is a philosophy of empowerment by which you know every small unit leader from the 21 year old corporal up to the general officer understands the mission and the intent of the mission and the reason for that is oftentimes you know the best laid plans don't work out and so in the fog of battle the chaos of war when the plan isn't working if everyone understands the mission you have a more adaptable military and you can create new plans very quickly from the lowest levels up to the highest levels. Now, the Russian model is a far more centralized model where the planning is far more intricate. The decision making is made by a small, much more senior group of officers. And that can work very well and be effective. But the challenge is when the mission doesn't go according to plan at the lower levels, there's this inability to adapt. And I think probably the, the greatest visual we have on that from this Ukraine war was if we were called the 40-mile convoy extending north from Kyiv. And I think in the early days, uh, many Ukrainians and observers were sort of terrified, you know, what is this enormous convoy that's going towards Kyiv? But the reality now in hindsight is that was really a, an enormous traffic jam. And things hadn't gone according to plan, and everyone in that convoy had no ability to adapt. So ultimately, these two different warfighting philosophies, we see them translating as a difference in adaptability on the battlefield. And the Russians have shown uh, an inability to adapt, particularly in this first month of the war. What has the uh, use of javelins and anti-tank weaponry uh, taught you about how tactics and uh, strategy are shifting in wars like this? Well, you know, this is a really important issue to be watching right now uh, in the war in Ukraine, uh, in so much as we're seeing a technological shift occur on the battlefield where these, these anti-tank missile systems like the Javelin and the British made Enlaw uh, are very capable and they are destroying the latest Russian tanks. Um, so these are what are called anti-platform weapons. They're decide, designed to destroy platforms like tanks, uh, you know, platforms also include things like high-tech fighter planes uh, and very expensive capital ships. And so what we're seeing as a trend is as these anti-platform systems become more effective, they reduce the importance and the centrality of these massive platforms on the battlefield. And the U.S. needs to be paying attention to this because the U.S. in particular, we have a very platform-centric view of warfare where all of our war fighting capacity is manifested in, if you're in the army in our tanks, if you're in the air force in our uh, fighter planes, like the very expensive F-35 or our aircraft carriers, if you're in the Navy. So as we look to the future conflicts the US could be engaged in, it's important to take away this lesson in Ukraine, which is we need to be very careful uh, that we're not confronting an adversary who we perceive as weaker, but who in fact has a very strong anti-platform capability that could level the battlefield for us. You're a Marine and fought in the battle for Fallujah. T 
tell me how that contrasts to the battle for Kiev that the Russians were trying to wage. When I, when I fought as a Marine in the Battle of Fallujah, uh, I was an infantry officer, and our infantry worked very closely with uh, our tanks, the Abrams Battle Tank, which is a, a state-of-the-art tank, but similar in capability as the Russian tanks. And I watched on numerous occasions as we were advancing into the city, uh, Abrams tanks absorb uh, rocket-propelled grenades, which was the best anti-tank weapon uh, the insurgents had against us. Now, those tanks, if they had, instead of being hit with a rocket-propelled grenade, had been hit with a javelin, uh, they would have been immediately catastrophically destroyed. And so the efficacy of tanks in an urban environment really is called into question when you have these very effective anti-tank missile systems. And uh, that's going to be very important to note in any potential battle uh, for a major Ukrainian city, uh, whether it's Kyiv or we've already seen this taking place uh, in cities like Mariupol and, uh, and even Kherson. So many analysts said that the Russians would just march right in like a blitzkrieg into Kiev. I think the Russians thought so as well. Why did they get it wrong? The, the big story here in, in, in Ukraine, as much as we've been talking about technology, and the technology is all great, um, but it is a story of, of motivation. Uh, the Russians have made the enormous mistake of underestimating Ukrainian motivations, understanding the essential feeling of nationality that Ukrainians have and have particularly developed uh, since 2014 when this war began with the Russians, because any Ukrainian you meet will tell you this war didn't start in February of this year. This war started in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. So the Russians really have underestimated what I would call you know, the moral aspects of this conflict. And the Ukrainians are fighting to defend their families uh, and their homes. And so you know, Napoleon has, uh, who fought many of his battles in that part of the war, uh, he has one of his maxims. And the maxim he said was the, the moral to the material in war is as three is to one. Uh, and we're seeing that right now, that the, the, the individuals who actually have that three to one advantage are not the Russians, uh, it is the Ukrainians. And I believe they will continue to enjoy that three to one advantage. And I think it's what's ultimately going to leave them as the victors in this war. That moral three to one force multiplier, is that just the Ukraine military or is that the grandmothers, the teenagers, the people of Ukraine all being part of a moral force that's winning this battle? I will say, you know, one of the things that's been most remarkable to me spending time over there, uh, particularly as someone who once considered himself a professional soldier, is that the vast majority of soldiers there, you know, the people we're watching each night on the nightly news, you know, they are not, in fact, soldiers. They are, you know, filmmakers, uh, bakers, the grandmothers you referred to, uh, young people who've left school to volunteer. Um, so this is really a, a, a true national mobilization of the sort that I have never seen in my lifetime and of the sort I've only read about in history books uh, dating back to, for instance, the Second World War. And now are they totally convinced that they can repel the Russian attack, especially on Kiev and central Ukraine? Walter, I was recently in Kiev and I was uh, talking to a uh, Ukrainian uh, filmmaker who had spent some time uh, actually as a political prisoner. Um, and I made the mistake of saying to him, do you think you'll make a movie about this after the war? And he leaned in closely and said to me, you know, around here, we don't say after the war. And I said, what do you say? He said, around here, we say after the victory. Wow. Uh, you wrote in Time magazine that there's a sentiment in Ukraine that this is not just the Russian leadership, but that this is Russia, the Russian people who are doing it to them. And I'd like to do a quote from that article. The Russian people have made a bargain with Putin. It's one they've made throughout their history. They have allowed a despot to take away their freedom, but in exchange, he has offered them glory. To what extent do the Ukrainians feel they're now at war with the Russian people? And the Ukrainians are quick to point out that if you haven't been paying attention to this region, there has been 20 plus years of Russian aggression, whether it's in Chechnya, in Georgia, uh, in, in Ukraine now, twice. Uh, and they believe that the, the Russian people have enabled Putin for two decades uh, and that Putin is not the problem 
that Putin is the symptom of a larger problem, and that is uh, Russian aggression. So the Ukrainians I know and have spoken with uh, feel very, very strongly that you cannot decouple this conflict from the Russian people themselves. And, I, and if you look at polling, uh, polling does show strong majority support within Russia for the war in Ukraine. So when Biden says this man cannot stay in power, referring to Putin, do you think a change in power in Russia would change this attitude of the Russians in terms of their expansionist views about Ukraine? I think a hope that a, a simple change of the person on top in Russia uh, is, a, is a solution to all of this is, is, is probably not realistic, that these are much, much much deeper problems uh, with regards to Russian aggression in that part of the world. Um, so I don't believe that simply trying to have a strategy that's solely focused on getting Putin out of power is somehow going to solve uh, the problems that we're seeing coming out of Russia. Those of us who write biographies always uh, wonder about the role of a singular person. And so I was going to ask you about President Zelensky. To what extent has his uh, sense of inspiration, his fortitude, uh, helped uh, make it so that Ukraine is, uh, seems to be uh, repelling the Russian invasion? And to what extent would this have happened even with a different leader? The best leaders are really vehicles by which nations are able to express and manifest their collective will. So I think President Zelensky is only as good as the Ukrainian people, but he has shown himself adept uh, at being a vessel to communicate uh, their collective will. And I think that the Ukrainian people are very fortunate that they have a leader like Zelensky right now. And I think President Zelensky is very fortunate that the Ukrainian people have all gotten behind me, uh, behind him. President Zelensky continually calls for more support from NATO, the United States, including air support. Uh, when you were there, was it, were there things you were hoping that the U.S. and the West should be doing? And do you think that would be wise for the U.S. to become more involved in this fight? Um, I think whether the, the U.S. and the West wants to become more involved in this fight or not is sort of beside the point. We are involved in this fight. Um, and it is, I believe, uh, an essential one. Uh, it's one that we haven't necessarily seen yet in our lifetimes. Um, so the Ukrainians have been very vocal, and rightly so, about the need to gain control of their airspace. We need to be giving the Ukrainians uh, at least the resources to set up their own no-fly zone if we want them to prevail in this war. And I would make I would argue that it's essential that they prevail in this war uh, against the Russians if we, uh, as a you know, as a free people, don't want to see the continued march of authoritarianism across the globe. As a Marine, what lessons do you think that the American military and forces like the Marines should take? What have we learned so far from this fighting? You know, Walter, I think we'll go, go back to this idea, uh, and it's really a strategic one, of the, uh, the essential nature of the moral in war. Uh, you know, we have in the last less than a year seen the fall of Afghanistan and now this invasion in Ukraine. And I think it's important to tie the two together. In the case of Afghanistan, we saw a highly equipped military that had been deeply trained, really invested in over years and years with a very dysfunctional government collapse in a matter of weeks. That was Afghanistan. In Ukraine, we have seen a government that you know, we haven't invested in in nearly the same way, have been very reluctant to equip, hold together, and shock the entire world. And the only real difference in those two cases is the moral factor, whether or not these people wanted to fight, whether or not they wanted to hold their country together. And I think as Americans and as the West, as we look forward and we try to figure out you know, the strategies that will secure our prosperity, uh, it's important to keep in mind the, the moral makeup of the countries we're bringing on as partners. Uh, so I think that that is an essential lesson coming out of this war in, in Ukraine, one that we should all focus on. So looking at how the Ukraines defended their freedom and contrasting that with the way the Afghan army didn't, does that make you think that it was a mistake the way we went into Afghanistan? Well, what it makes me think is, you know, oftentimes 
times we have a tendency to try to disconnect the, the military aspect of a conflict uh, from the political aspect of a conflict. As we look at a conflict like a Ukraine or in an Afghanistan and understand that what we saw in Afghanistan in terms of the military defeat was very much linked into the political dynamics on the ground in Afghanistan. And what we're seeing in Ukraine right now, which is a remarkable uh, victory with regards to the Russians, and a really remarkable demonstration of capability is directly tied into the politics of Ukraine. And so any country that just segregates the military from the political and tries to think about them separately is, is going to wind up making strategic errors. If there is a compromise to try to end this war, and it involves Ukraine being neutral and uh, forswearing being part of NATO, and if it uh, requires giving up control of some of the Donbass and Crimea or making it disputed territories. Do you think the Ukrainians will approve something like that? I think it's, at least at this moment, <clears throat> battlefield conditions being what they are, I think it's very difficult to see an outcome by which the Ukrainian people uh, would accept a peace built on terms by which they had to concede the Donbass and concede Crimea back to the Russians. You know, the Ukrainian people, and I think correctly so, view themselves as being the, the winners of this war thus far. And as the winners, they don't believe they should have to concede anything. It's the losers who concede, and they view the Russians as the losers. Now, obviously, the, you know, the Russians have made incursions into Ukraine, but um, the Ukrainian people are by no way chastened by what's happened the last month. And I don't think President Zelensky would have the, uh, the ability to hand over, even if he wanted to, to hand over territory uh, to the Russians. Um, so, you know, we're going to have to see how this plays out in the, the weeks and months ahead. And I anticipate you're going to see a lot of jockeying on the battlefield for a position that could lead to advantages in the negotiating room. Um, but at least psychologically, right now, uh, the Ukrainians don't, at least the ones that I've been talking with, don't feel uh, they need to concede anything. And I think it would be very difficult for President Zelensky to, to do so and politically survive at home. Elliot Ackerman. As always, very enlightening. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.